All right, good afternoon. Uh, so today we are going to talk about the opposite side of the coin uh, from Apollo, and that is Dionysus. So as I alluded to before, um, always think of Apollo and Dionysus as uh, two complementary opposites that really represent um, two important aspects of the human condition. Okay? Apollo representing rationality and logic and philosophy, and Dionysus representing you know, our irrational and uh, you know, animal instincts um, in order to form uh, kind of the full kind of human experience. Uh, so let's jump in. So uh, as before, we'll look at Dionysus's origins, nature, and functions. Okay, where did he come from? What's he like? Uh, what's he do for us? Uh, and then we'll look at some of Dionysus's principal myths that uh, explain a lot of these things okay, in context. Okay, our key terms and names are Dionysus, Semele, Menads, Thyrsus, Satyrs, and Pentheus. Okay, uh, so before we dive in, I thought it would be useful to get a sense of what the religious uh, worship of Dionysus was like. Uh, so um, I'd like you to pause this video um, and think to yourself uh, of an experience in your life, a one-time experience or a regularly occurring one, where you abandoned yourself to pure instinct, felt liberated from the bounds of your own self, and was at one with a greater whole. After this experience, you felt rejuvenated and ready to return to the daily grind. So if this happened to you, in what setting did this occur, and what factors contributed to this ecstatic experience? Okay, so again, pause the video and reflect on this, and it should be useful for uh, the lecture moving forward. So I will speak from my own experience. Um, I often compare the worship of Dionysus <clears throat> to a heavy metal concert. Okay? Um, Dionysiac rituals often are, involve uh, more than one person sharing in a common experience um, together. Um, so in a heavy metal concert, you know, you're there with a bunch of other people, uh, and you are all witnessing uh, a band playing, and they're playing uh, various instruments, various loud and... Uh, dissonant instruments, uh, and so Dionysiac rituals often involved flutes and drums uh, and other uh, loud music uh, beat to a certain rhythm, and the idea was that that music would envelop you, uh, and it would help uh, induce a sort of trance-like state. So in heavy metal concerts, you know, there's lots of bodily movements, such as head banging, uh, which... Uh, and I can tell you from experience, does help induce a sort of um, transcendent state uh, in which you feel over, the music washes over you, uh, and you feel uh, at one with a greater whole. Um, often in a heavy metal concert, this experience is enhanced by the consumption of various substances, uh, smoked or drunk or otherwise, uh, and certainly uh, Dionysus as the god of wine, uh, you can see the connection there. Okay? So, uh, you know, you might have had similar experiences at uh, concerts of your own favorite music or when you uh, go dancing uh, or maybe when you're playing sports uh, and you feel that you're just in the zone. You know, maybe when you exercise, there's some sort of uh, neurochemical experience that um, allows you to... Um, step outside of yourself uh, and feel uh, sort of this transcendence or that you are connecting with something which you might call spiritual or otherwise, okay? So yeah, there's, my, there's me there and there's my buddy John. Hey, we're kind of concert buzzies. Okay, so uh, Dionysus is uh, technically one of the Olympians. Um, he is considered the 12th Olympian alongside Hestia, uh, and poor Hestia, we'll, we'll, give, we'll talk to her, we'll talk about her, you know, soon, uh, but what seems to have happened is that Dionysus joined the Pantheon after all the rest of the gods, and that uh, for some reason uh, the Greeks decided to kick Hestia out of 
that number of 12 um, in order to bring Dionysus in. However, Kestia was still very important uh, to the Greeks, um, and so they continued to worship her. Um, however, the fact that she sort of kind of stayed on Olympus and didn't really do much, uh, you know, made her uh, thought to be, you know, not part of this, uh, of these 12 gods, uh, which is unfortunate. But then again, Hades is also not counted as one of the 12, but he's certainly a very important and respected god as well. All right, so we're back to our uh, theological uh, genealogy here. So um, like uh, uh, Artemis and Apollo and uh, Hermes, as we've talked about, uh, Dionysus is the product of a union of Zeus and somebody other than Hera. Um, however, unlike uh, Leto or Maya, uh, Semele was a mortal woman. And so we have to figure out, well, why was Dionysus a full-fledged god um, if, um, you know, one of his parents was mortal? Uh, we, well, there was a, an interesting process that led to that. So let's get into it uh, in a moment. So uh, we'll talk about um, Dionysus himself, sort of his uh, base qualities here. Okay, so first off, his name, um, various theories as to why he's called Dionysus. So the Dio in his name uh, from Dios, okay, meaning Zeus. Um, so connected to this mountain called Nyssa, where we're not sure where it is. So maybe it's the Zeus of Nyssa or Zeus of Mount Nyssa, or maybe the Nyssus part of it means son, so son of Zeus, okay, which would make sense. Um, the Greeks also called him Bacchus, um, as one of his other names, and the Romans called him Bacchus as well, but the Romans also called him Liber, uh, and that is significant uh, because that is also the root of the word liberty and liberation, okay? Um, the idea that Liber, or Dionysus, or Bacchus is a god of liberation, somebody who represents human freedom, the liberation uh, from the bounds of rationality, uh, of morality, uh, and whatnot, kind of the spirit of rebellion, kind of, you know, again, crossing these boundaries, even the boundaries of your own self. So um, he is certainly popularly thought of as the god of wine, and he certainly is. Um, here we see the grape clusters uh, that make up the crown around his head, um, but he's also more broadly a fertility god. So he is the male spirit uh, of fertility, um, the, the life force uh, that makes plants grow, uh, and that gives energy to wild beasts as well as to humans, okay, this kind of pr uh, fertile energy that humans have. Um, and he is the male principle of fertility, whereas we will see that Persephone and Demeter are the female uh, side of that kind of fertility principle, okay, because you need both in order for to make things um, grow and come to being, of course, right? Um, so as the god of wine, he is responsible for introducing wine and wine making to mortals. Um, and uh, the myth of his uh, of him doing this uh, is quite instructive about as to the nature of Dionysus and his worship and his power. So he taught wine making to a, a, an Athenian named Icarius, um, taught him how to uh, cultivate uh, grapevines. Um, but what happened was Icarius, uh, you know, started making wine and he, uh, decided this is a pretty cool thing. I'm going to share it with my friends. And so he gave some wine to some shepherds, uh, and the shepherds, you know, had never, you know, had alcohol before. Uh, and so they started feeling the effects of the alcohol on them. And their first thought was, oh God, this guy's poisoning me. Uh, we better kill him before we die. And so they, uh, so they killed him. Um, but then realized that, no, this wasn't poison. This was just some sort of substance that uh, altered their minds. Uh, and then eventually people got the idea that this was the spirit of Dionysus who was altering their perception and allowing them to tune into some sort of spiritual wavelength. But again, this... Uh, Myth is instructive of both the blessings and dangers of drunkenness. Um, as you can imagine, okay, all of the positive feelings that can come from intoxication, but also 
the dangers, whether um, the various behaviors uh, that it could induce, or certainly the after effects when it wears off. And uh, I won't get into that, but uh, just one more thing. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, statues of Dionysus, because what this actually is, um, is this is a statue of the uh, boyfriend of the Roman Emperor Hadrian, a man named Antinous, um, and Hadrian dressed him up in the guise of Dionysus, okay, because um, when, da when Antinous uh, passed away prematurely, Hadrian was devastated and decided to have Antinous worshipped as a god, which is a thing that normally Roman emperors uh, would do uh, for, them, uh, for their predecessors. Um, so there's that. All right, so again, not just the god of wine and fertility, but also the god of ecstasy and intoxication. And that's not just um, ecstasy and intoxication induced by drugs or wine, uh, but even just the state of ecstasy you can achieve, again, by listening to music or dancing or both, uh, as I mentioned, the metal concert. Um, so ecstasy itself is the Greek word ekstasis, which means to stand outside oneself. Okay, to kind of lose yourself into some sort of greater spiritual whole, uh, as if you were uh, possessed by the god Dionysus or in some sort of spiritual union with him. Okay? And so the idea of ecstasy is it, it liberates your instincts, okay? your carnal desires, uh, your animal side, and it liberates it from the bounds of rational control. So if you think of your power of reason, the Apollo in you keeps your, uh, your irrational instincts at bay. Uh, but in the context of worshiping Dionysus, this is a context in which you can let loose. Okay? Um, he's also the god of crossing various boundaries. Okay? Um, but whereas Hermes is the god of crossing physical boundaries, okay, such as just the trod of travelers, but also the boundaries between the world and the underworld. Uh, Dionysus is the crosser of more internal boundaries. Um, so worshiping Dionysus uh, is an opportunity to um, experiment with the boundaries of gender, um, with various roles in society. Uh, and this is also why he's the god of the theater. If you think of uh, actors in the theater are putting on the identities of somebody else, and they are essentially worshiping Dionysus uh, by pretending to be somebody else and experimenting with different identities, uh, including identities of gender. Uh, in the Greek theater, actors were only male, yet um, we have seen several Greek tragedies uh, where there are female characters. So um, again, that is connected to Dionysus. Um, and again, this ritual outlet of animalistic energies uh, is also um, a form of spiritual renewal. Okay? The, this worship is a safe context in which you can uh, ex experiment like this and let loose so that you feel refreshed and then can return to society uh, as you know, a good upstanding person. So like other gods, he has various symbols. Like Apollo, he's symbolized by the goat, which is itself a very highly sexually potent animal, okay? um, but also panthers and leopards. Okay? So he's represented on a chariot pulled by big cats, such as those. Uh, also the bull, another potent sexual symbol. Um, plants such as ivy and grape clusters, of course, but also drums, cymbals, and flutes. Again, loud, boisterous instruments uh, that are used in his worship. And finally, uh, he's also symbolized by the thyrsus, uh, which uh, Antinous here is holding in his uh, left hand here. Um, the thyrsus is essentially a staff, um, which could also be a fennel stalk that is topped by a pine cone. And uh, this was intentionally a phallic symbol, okay, a fertility symbol, um, you know, uh, suggested by its, its, both its shape, but also the fact that pine cones contain pine sap, which is connected to uh, fertility, okay, as you can imagine. All right, so let's talk about where Dionysus came from. So Dionysus was a god that was born twice, and this explains why he was born a god and not just a hero um, or a demigod. 
So his mother was uh, the mortal woman named Semele, and Semele herself was the daughter of Cadmus and Harmonia. So Cadmus was the founder of the city of Thebes, um, and Harmonia was the daughter of uh, one of the offspring of the affair of Ares and Aphrodite. So Semele herself, you know, was the uh, granddaughter of gods. Um, so she already had some divine uh, lineage in her already, which helps. So um, it seems that uh, Zeus's relationship with Semele was uh, more or less consensual and ongoing. Um, he appears to have appeared to her in the guise of a mortal. Um, however, Hera, being ever jealous, uh, caught wind of this affair, and she decided because she couldn't punish Zeus, she was going to punish uh, Semele. And so Hera appeared to Semele one day in the form of an old woman, uh, and um, basically... Uh, talked to Semele and was like, uh, how's your boyfriend doing? And Semele said, you want to know a secret? My boyfriend tells me that he's actually Zeus. And Hera says, uh, well, how do you know he's actually Zeus? Maybe he's just pulling your leg in order to, uh, you know, in order to sleep with you. Uh, and so uh, Semele says, well, how can I find out if he's actually Zeus? And uh, Hera tells Semele, well, um, Tell him that uh, if he's really Zeus, um, that um, make him swear by the river Styx that he will give you uh, whatever you want. Uh, and then after he swears by the Styx, uh, tell him that you would want him to appear to her in his mortal, in his immortal form, okay, as a god. Uh, and so uh, Semele manages to get Zeus to swear by the sticks, um, and swearing by the sticks is to swear an oath that not even a god uh, can break. And so Zeus reluctantly obeys Semele and reveals his true form, okay, his divine glory, which is so intense. It's basically uh, the end of the Raiders of the Lost Ark when the Nazis uh, behold the Ark of the Covenant, and their faces melt off. Okay, uh, Semele burst into flames and died. At that point, she was already six months pregnant uh, with the infant Dionysus, and so uh, Zeus rescued the fetus from uh, Semele before she died uh, and sewed it into his own thigh. And three months later, uh, uh, Dionysus was born a second time, and because of that three months gestation in Zeus's thigh, uh, he uh, emerged as a full-fledged god. Okay, uh, and here's one of my favorite uh, medieval Greek or Byzantine uh, manuscript images uh, showing Zeus dressed like a Byzantine emperor with uh, the baby Dionysus uh, emerging from his thigh. Okay. Kind of creepy, but medieval art is sort of sort of like that. So what now? Um, well, the infant Dionysus was then entrusted to Semele's sister Ino, who was queen of the city of Orchomenus, or Orchomenus, uh, and uh, he was disguised in woman's clothing uh, so that Hera wouldn't notice. Well, Hera did notice. But the point here is that already we have the origin of Dionysus's uh, kind of symbolism of the crossing and ambiguity of gender boundaries. Um, Hera uh, tried to do away with Dionysus by driving Ino and her husband Athamas insane. Uh, they killed their own children, and eventually Ino uh, jumped into the sea uh, in a crazed fit, um, but was transformed into a sea nymph, uh, Leucothea, who will show up in the Odyssey. So, uh, before we continue with the adventures of Dionysus, uh, let's look at an alternate, uh, origin story. Um, and as we've seen, and we've seen a bit of this before, um, there was a specific religious sect in ancient Greece called the Orphics, who followed the religion of Orphism, uh, which had very idiosyncratic uh, views on mythology. Okay? So they thought of their version of Dionysus uh, was uh, a god called Zagreus. Okay? 
So uh, Orphism, uh, the Orphics believed that the person who started their religion was the um, poet Orpheus, uh, who we'll talk about uh, when we talk about the descent into Hades uh, with Eurydice and all of that. Um, but the point is, is that because, uh, he formed a religion because he descended into the underworld and he brought back knowledge about how to live your life so that uh, your time in the underworld is actually pleasant, okay? because the default is that it's rather not. So according to the Orphix, Dionysus was not the son of Zeus and Zemele, Zemele originally, but the son of Zeus and Persephone. Uh, here we go with the incest again. Um, and uh, what happened was, was during the, Titan, the Titanomachy, um, Dionysus was actually torn apart and eaten by the Titans. Um, and this connects to um, the idea of sparagmos, uh, or the ritual tearing apart of animals, um, you know, in Dionysiac rituals. Um, there's also a connection here to Christianity where, um, you know, Jesus is, his, his death is a form of ritual tearing apart, and even the act of communion is the eating part. Um, so there's the connection there. But anyway, after the Titans did this to Dionysus, uh, Zeus uh, struck them with his thunderbolts, and the Zeus and the Titans were reduced to dust. Um, when Dionysus was torn apart, Athena managed to rescue his heart. And for some reason, Zeus decided to swallow Dionysus' heart. Uh, and subsequently, he got together with Semele, impregnated her, and as a result, Semele's child was the reborn Dionysus, okay? hence the twice born. Okay? So again, the connections to Christianity, um, perhaps a kind of a forerunner to Christianity here is this worship of a son of God or son of Zeus who was uh, killed uh, but then was resurrected. Okay, um, so there you go. Um, and then this is also something we already talked about with one possible human origin story. Um, the Orphics thought that humans were created by a mixture of the Titan dust and Dionysus, and hence we have this spark of divinity of Dionysus within all of us, but is it, it is encased in evil matter. Okay, so, um, you know, there's a philosophical side here where there's sort of this spiritual uh, kind of practice to um, cultivate that divine spark and to not give in to uh, the evil of our mortal flesh. Okay, so hence Orphism emphasizes moral asceticism, but they also believe in reincarnation, okay, on the, on the uh, basis of Dionysus, but also Orpheus's uh, return from the underworld. Uh, and again, Orpheus's knowledge of the underworld um, uh, turns into precepts for how to make sure you have a good afterlife. Okay, so again, that is an alternative myth of the origin of Dionysus um, that was pretty much exclusively held by the Orphics, okay? So this is not a common uh, belief, but it's fun, isn't it? Okay, so let's continue uh, Dionysus' story um, after, um, you know, Ino and Athamas uh, go nuts. So eventually uh, Dionysus goes off to um, a mountain called Nyssa, hence Dionysus. Um, we're not sure what this mountain is. It's either, it might be in Thrace, it might be in Phrygia. Um, according to some versions, uh, Hera drives him mad. Uh, according to other versions, uh, it's because he discovered winemaking uh, that he gets really drunk and goes mad, and then he wanders to Phrygia, and Phrygia is in modern-day Turkey. Okay, so he's on the other side of the Aegean Sea from Greece at this point. And there he meets Rhea, um, or as the locals called her in Phrygia, uh, Sibele. Okay? Uh, and uh, in gratitude to Rhea, um, he adopts um, the local uh, religious rites uh, that had uh, grown up around her there, uh, various ecstatic rites, Dionysiac rituals, but also Eastern dress. Okay, So in uh, the east of Greece, um, the Greeks thought, and, you know, people did do this, um, people like the Persians and otherwise, um, they dressed more in loose and long flowing clothing. Both men and women did this. But the Greeks uh, thought that this, this style of dress was effeminate, 
uh, and that's why they represent Dionysus as, again, having this gender ambiguity. Um, on his adventures to the east, Dionysus eventually uh, recruits an entourage, uh, collectively known as the Bacantes, or the worshippers of Bacchus, okay, another name for Dionysus. Uh, and so uh, a lot of the female followers of Dionysus uh, came to be known as menads, or literally maddened ones, again, those who um, abandoned rationality um, you know, to take part in his rites. And the menads would often carry the thyrsus, again, the staff with I that is with ivy and the pine cone. So here's another representation of that here, of Dionysus, who is riding a leopard, okay, another animal associated with him. Um, also part of this entourage were these beings called satyrs. Um, these were humanoid beings. Um, they had the ears of horses um, and the tail and legs of goats, so they were similar to Pan. Uh, but they also uh, had giant erections. Again, these uh, uh, the connection of uh, Dionysus to male fertility and potency. Okay? And so on, with this entourage, uh, he essentially built an army uh, and he spread the worship of himself as far as India. Okay? And uh, our source for this, uh, a very late Greek writer toward the end of antiquity named Nonus, wrote a very, very, very long epic poem about the adventures of Dionysus uh, and his conquest of India uh, called the Dionysiaca. Okay? I haven't read it. Most classicists don't read it. Uh, but if you're really into Dionysus, uh, I imagine uh, it's rewarding. Okay? But it's there for you. Okay. So some artistic representations of uh, people in Dionysus's entourage. So on the left, we have a red figure painting of both a menad and a satyr. Uh, so um, here's the menad with the ivy crown, um, and uh, she's got a, a nice big thyrsus there, which she is now using to uh, repel, you know, an ever uh, horny satyr, uh, who, you, as you can tell, uh, is quite interested in her, but she, despite, you know, being abandoned to irrationality, still... Um, has, you know, her own personal boundaries that she wishes to enforce. On the right here, we have another figure uh, of a menad, um, again with a thyrsus here, um, with uh, snakes uh, as a headband, okay, another symbol uh, associated with Dionysus, and uh, she is also uh, has a cat in her hand, uh, and unfortunately, this might suggest that this is an animal that she is about to sacrifice in a ritual called Sparagmos, in which uh, it is a ritual tearing apart of animals uh, that was a part of Dionysiac worship. Okay. All right, so um, eventually, after Dionysus uh, conquers India and the rest of the East, uh, he returns to his birthplace of Greece. Um, on the way, he crosses the Aegean Sea and ends up on the island of Naxos, where he finds a woman named Ariadne, okay, who was the erstwhile uh, sweetheart of the hero Theseus, who had rescued her, or, well, didn't rescue her, but much she sort of uh, went with him uh, after he defeated the Minotaur uh, on Crete. Ariadne was the daughter of Queen of King Minos, but for some reason he abandoned her on Crete and then went back to Athens because he's Theseus and he's a huge jerk, and we'll get to that when we get to him. But uh, Dionysus, you know, despite his um, status as a god of sexual potency, seems to have been an exception to this idea that the Olympian gods were, you know, uh, serial rapists and philanderers, because Dionysus seems to have, uh, when he offered his hand in marriage to Ariadne, and she accepted, uh, remained faithful to her. I cannot think of any myths in which Dionysus was unfaithful to his mortal bride, whom he later made immortal. Okay. Um, so when Dionysus got back to Greece um, and tried to introduce, um, you know, his various modes of worship, there was quite a bit of resistance. Um, this was a lesson in Greek xenophobia. Um, they thought that his rites were, uh, you know, 
from the East, and they were foreign, they were not Greek. Uh, and not only that, but they were perverted because they involved these irrational rituals, and there were rumors that this was basically, you know, giant orgies uh, in which people just, you know, did everything you'd expect in those, and that these were subversive uh, because, again, these were rituals in which you would cross boundaries of gender and social norms. Okay? This would encourage women to go outside, you know, shocking, shocking thought there, okay? So we'll talk about Agave and, Pisi and Pentheus uh, of Thebes as an object lesson in what happens uh, when you uh, turn down uh, Dionysus's invitation to join his religion. Um, but before we get to that, um, Dionysus, again, being associated with death and rebirth, um, himself descends to the underworld in order to rescue his mother, Semele, and Hades agrees uh, to let her go, uh, and he brings her back. Um, out of the underworld, and uh, she becomes the goddess Theone, becomes immortal. Okay, so, um, so not only is he very uh, is he faithful to his wife, but he's also um, highly devoted to his mother. So um, good for him. All right, um, and uh, one of the most iconic uh, paintings uh, from the Italian Renaissance uh, of Dionysus is this one by uh, Titian, Bacco e Ariana. Uh, so this is uh, Dionysus's uh, encounter with Ariadne, who had been abandoned on Naxos, and apparently she, it was, she was quite impressed. And we can see here um, his band of menads and satyrs uh, with, their with their thirsty and all of that. And even uh, here is the leg of a pack animal that's been torn off okay, from that a ritual of Spiragmos there. Oh, and there's the head there. I've never noticed that before. Okay. All right, so the last thing we'll talk about is, um, the last myth we'll talk about uh, is the myth of Pentheus, um, as told by the play playwright Euripides in one of his last plays, The Bacchae. Okay, and the Bacchae is the chorus in the play um, played by Menads, um, or Bacchae, okay, women who worship Bacchus or Dionysus. Okay, so um, kind of the backstory to this play is that uh, there's a woman, Agave, who, or Agave, rather, uh, who was Semele's sister. However, um, Agave was skeptical that uh, Semele was really the uh, consort of Zeus, and Agave basically thought that her sister, um, you know, was basically cheating with, was having an affair with somebody, uh, but then said it was Zeus in order to, uh, you know, excuse her, um, her infidelity. Um, and that this was tantamount to hubris, uh, and therefore she was struck by Zeus's lightning as punishment for spreading this lie. Um, and because Agave believed this, um, she didn't think that Dionysus was a god at all. Okay? There was not any divine blood in him. Okay? This is not somebody we should worship. So Dionysus uh, caught wind of this and decided to have quite the homecoming in order to punish uh, Agave and anyone else who resisted his worship. So he turned to, theme, to Thebes, but he dressed and uh, disguised himself as a mortal man, specifically as a priest of himself, which is wonderful. Uh, and what he does is he casts his spell on Agave uh, and the rest of the women of Thebes and turns them into Bacchae, into Menads. Um, and they, so they abandon their looms and they go out of the house where they belonged uh, and they went into the woods uh, and had uh, many a revel uh, in worshiping Dionysus uh, and indulging in uh, these orgiastic rites. So um, Agave's son is the king of Thebes named Pentheus. And Pentheus uh, basically went on a mission to try to get rid of uh, the cult of Dionysus uh, from Thebes because he thought that this was a religion that was subversive, uh, that caused the women of the city to um, abandon their traditional gender roles and to leave the city and go run wild in the woods. Um, so 
basically what happened was is he encountered this priest of Dionysus, who was Dionysus in disguise. Uh, but Dionysus in this disguise uh, managed to trick Pentheus into trying to go uh, do some reconnaissance on these Bacchae. Uh, and in order to do this recon, uh, he had Pentheus uh, disguise himself as a woman. Okay, so again, we see the, the crossing of gender boundaries. However, this was all an elaborate ruse, uh, because when Pentheus uh, was spying on the Bacchae, uh, basically uh, he was spotted by them, and uh, they proceeded to take him and tear him apart, okay, at, as if he were a wild animal that was being sacrificed in this uh, ritual spiragmos. Um, specifically, Agave, who was under Dionysus' spell, uh, was hallucinating so much that she thought that she was actually tearing apart a lion, uh, when it was fact, in fact, it was her own son. Uh, and so she went back to Thebes, carrying the head of this quote-unquote lion and presenting it to, uh, uh, to presenting it to her father Cadmus, and everyone else looked on in horror, and eventually she snapped out of her hallucinogenic state and realized what she had done. Um, so an object lesson in uh, disobeying uh, or rejecting this form of religious ritual, um, which you can interpret as, um, you know, you gotta have uh, some context in your life where you can walk on the wild side. Okay, for me, it's going to metal shows. Uh, for you, it could be something else. So this vase painting on the right, which I will end with, is one of the more uh, graphic uh, horror movie, death metal, whatever uh, vase paintings you can find. Uh, Theseus uh, being torn apart uh, by his mother and by the mean ads. Um, you know, he's already been torn in half at this point. Okay, so... I will leave uh, you with that wonderful image, uh, and I will see you next time.